sick for a while, so I'm just testing my voice. This is like the first time I've spoken all day. Can you guys hear me in the back? All right, can you guys hear me way too loud now? I'm trying to figure out my distance from the mic on this. Maybe I'll just, I'll hide back here. Cool. What's that? But these fine people still get to hear me. So. No, all right, I'll, I'll try to stay near the, uh, try to stay near the mic. <clears throat> you good? All right, uh, my name is Josh Rosenblatt. Uh, today's presentation is going to be, I went fishing and caught a charge. I have a series of about 14 disclaimers, which is uh, how you guys know that I'm an attorney. Uh, the first disclaimer is that uh, it turns out the law is complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving pieces. We're going to hit some of the high points, but that doesn't mean that you're going to leave here knowing the law, okay? So, you know, like you know a little bit, and as they say, a little bit kind of a dangerous thing. <clears throat> All right, what we're going to talk about here is Maryland law. Uh, I'm going to get into it in a little bit in terms of the, the variation among the states with regard to law, uh, but every, every state sort of inherited the uh, common law class and then just went out on their own after that. Uh, so I'm going to be talking specifically about Maryland law, but a lot of these concepts carry over to other states, especially the original colony states. Uh, I work for the Baltimore Police Department. I teach at the University of Baltimore. Uh, which means that I'm also beholden to the Marion City Council of Baltimore. Uh, I do not speak for any of them today. Uh, so whatever I say, uh, hold me accountable. That's fine. But none of these fine folks. <clears throat> In addition, uh, like I said before, I've been uh, battling a cold. So uh, might also be influenced a little bit by uh, things in the pharmacy aisle. The regular pharmacy aisle. Nothing over the counter. Should be good. Still good to drop. All right. Uh, who am I? Like I said, my name is uh, Joshua Rosenblatt. Uh, I am an attorney. I'm also a sergeant with the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, I'm the head of the legal instruction. Uh, took over there about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, took over their law program. Uh, changed a lot of things. Whole separate talk. Whole separate talk. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I also am an adjunct at the University of Baltimore. Uh, I teach in the Digital Forensics Department, teaching criminal and civil liability, specifically with regard to digital crimes. Uh, I'm also the former division chief of the Crime Strategies Unit with the Office of the State's Attorney for Baltimore City. So I'm a former prosecutor, current police officer, who was also a former police officer, who was also an adjunct at the University of Baltimore. And mostly, uh, I'm a law nerd. I mean, I'm an everything nerd, uh, but specifically, I am a law nerd. Uh, so, we're going to get into it a little bit. All right. <clears throat> so, the, the whole idea here is I'm going to give kind of a uh, mocked up situation with regard to a uh, full scope black box penetration test. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what Maryland law might have to do with those things. So, let's suppose situation. Uh, you're hired to do a uh, full black box pen test of a, a company. We'll call them creatively Company X. Uh, contrast said full assessment, but there was no set scope. Uh, company employees frequently work from home, and it operates a bring-your-own-device environment. In addition to that, there's also shadow IT. Different divisions have their own little setups that they do without talking to the, uh, the official IT department, and people bring their own devices, not only mobile phones, laptops, things like that, but you also see things like uh, um, commercial, I'm not sorry, uh, consumer-grade routers, that sort of thing. Uh, company X is located in an office building. You will find many companies don't actually own the real estate that they, uh, they exist in. Uh, and that's the state with Company X here. We'll call them uh, Landlord L is the person that they rent from. Now, Company X does a lot of business with Baltimore City. So Baltimore City employees are in and out of there all the time. Uh, Landlord L has a security guard, but they kind of wave through anyone with a city ID, anyone with a company X ID, anyone with a landlord ID, almost anyone with an ID. All right, so that's the situation we're going to work with, uh, and we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, how different aspects of the pen test uh, relate to Maryland law. So at the beginning, we got the, uh, the physical assessment. We're going to talk about different criminal entry crimes, all right, criminal trespassing, criminal burglary. Uh, we're going to hit on a couple other different points. We're going to talk about uh, social assessment, social engineering. What aspects of social engineering are actually crimes in Maryland? Uh, what do you have to do? What are the limits? Uh, we're going to talk about digital assessment. 
basically, the federal government set up the CFAA, uh, wiretap laws, everything like that. Maryland has also enacted its own local versions of all these different things. And then we're going to talk about, okay, if things go wrong, uh, what do I do if the police show up? So we're going to talk a little bit about that sort of thing. Before we can do that, we have to talk a little bit about the law. We got a little, uh, you need to understand a couple things before I start uh, heading straight into uh, Maryland law. You have to understand the law in general. So where does the law come from? Well, basically it turns out on July 5th, 1776, it was not anarchy. People were not free to murder and pillage and everything like that because, you know, we just gotten rid of England. Uh, now there's no laws. Now it turns out we just kept all the laws, deleted the parts about the king, and went on. We refer to all that as the common law. The common law. The law that we inherited from England. Now, we have different levels to our government. A little 20 seconds on high school civics. We got the federal level, we got the state level, we got the local level. Now, federal level, it's all statutory. Congress has to make a law for the law to exist. However, once Congress makes that law, it's interpreted all over the country in different ways. If you're in California, the Ninth Circuit tells you what that law means. If you're in Maryland, the Fourth Circuit tells you what that law means. So the exact same law can be interpreted different ways depending on where you are in the country. Now, the problem with the Internet is, let me, let me tell you guys a little bit about the Internet, uh, it turns out it's worldwide. One might even say there is a worldwide web. Now, what does that matter? Well, you could be in Maryland accessing a, uh, a server in Delaware, accessing uh, you know, resources in California that are going across, uh, across the Pacific, over into Japan. It's all over the place. So whose law applies? And it turns out pretty much everyone's law applies. And because of that, you have to look at all the different points and figure out what the narrowest uh, area to work in is. It's what makes uh, being an attorney in this particular field so very interesting. Now, Maryland law. Maryland law has that common law I talked about. All those laws we inherited from England, Maryland has. Again, just erase the part about the king. We also have statutory law. Every year, uh, the fine folks down in Annapolis come up with a new set of laws that they uh, feel like everyone should, uh, should follow, uh, based largely on what's been in the Baltimore Sun and USA Today. Uh, they then go forward and they make laws. They take action to protect all of us. Uh, like I said before, the common law are the laws we inherited from England. That's why you'll find uh, the laws in Maryland, the laws in Virginia, the laws in all the original colonies um, have a very, very similar base uh, because they all inherited these common laws from England. In addition to that, you also have your local municipalities, uh, county governments, city governments, things like that, and they all make their own laws. Now, the way it works is that, that no one can go, can overstep the branch above them but they can kind of create their own little niches. So, let's pretend uh, you got this guy. Let's call him Russell. All right? Now, Russell lives in Baltimore. So what laws does Russell have to worry about? Well, at the federal level, he has U.S. constitutional laws interpreted by the Supreme Court. Narrowed down, he has U.S. constitutional law as interpreted by the Fourth Circuit. He also has U.S. federal law as interpreted by the Supreme Court and the Fourth Circuit. Uh, he also has U.S. administrative law, dealing with things like uh, how many pounds per square inch a seatbelt has to stop, things like that. Uh, you also have state laws. All right? You have state uh, statutory laws, administrative regulations, uh, in addition to uh, case law. And at the local level, you have city ordinances, the city statutes. Uh, you also have agency regulations. Uh, if you want to apply for a permit for something, agency regulations are going to affect that. So that's it. That's all Russell has to worry about, as long as he never leaves Baltimore City. Uh, of course, uh, Russell might have bigger issues, but that's a whole separate talk again. <clears throat> Fortunately, you may think to yourself, there's so many laws. If only there was one centralized location where I could find them. And it turns out there is. The way the criminal justice system works in Maryland is that uh, everything is screened through what's called a court commissioner. They're the ones that assign, uh, say, okay, this charge is being applied to this person. Here's the code we're going to give it. Uh, there's you know, a four-digit code that goes with every state law. Well, court commissioners are not attorneys. Uh, they are you know, college graduates who, who have this job. They need a resource to use, and we can take advantage of that. The resource they use is known as the CJIS manual, the Court uh, Criminal Justice Information System Manual. Uh, so it's a handy little cheat sheet for all the laws at the state level. 
It doesn't deal with federal level laws. It doesn't deal with local laws, but it only Maryland. And at a, as a cheat sheet, um, it's, 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 you know, 457 pages. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a lengthy cheat sheet. But if you want just one central place to go, uh, you can either do a site search of uh, Maryland laws, or you can just go to the CGIS manual, see what it has to say about that. Uh, no. All right. <clears throat> now, again, here we're just talking about Maryland law. All right. So I'm limiting the scope to just these 457 pages of summary. Uh, hopefully, you guys did your homework. You read this before you came here, so you're going to know exactly where I am when we get to different points. All right, first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of the uh, pen test is going to be the physical scope. All right, the physical scope of the uh, pen test. Let's pretend you come home, you, uh, you go to the store, you go to talk to a neighbor, something like that. You leave your front door wide open. You come home, and uh, this individual is sitting on your couch eating potato chips, eating his own potato chips, just to make this nice and, uh, nice and linear. Has he committed a crime? Has a crime been committed at this point? He, he invaded the privacy of your home and is munching on potato crisps. Well, there's two main crimes when it comes to uh, entry. We have trespass and we have burglary. Generally speaking, trespass is being somewhere uh, that you're not supposed to be. Burglary generally involves some sort of breaking and entering. Uh, in Maryland, there are two types of trespassing crimes. There's trespassing on posted property, and there's what's known as wanton trespass, or trespassing after a warning. So, posted property, it's pretty straightforward. If it's posted against trespassing and you trespass, you're guilty. All right, that one's pretty straightforward. That's why you see these signs all over the place that say posted, no trespassing. Um, obviously, the fact that they are posted, never mind, you get it. All right? But these signs must be posted conspicuously. They must be posted in a way that anyone who walks in would be you know, their attention would be called to it. That's why they're frequently in this sort of fluorescent orange uh, coloring. You're supposed to draw your attention to it. Now, oh. the other way is wanton trespass, or trespassing after warning. That's where you've been told not to be there. Maybe you did something you weren't supposed to do in the dressing room. I don't know. All right, but you are not no longer supposed to be in this location. You've been warned not to be in this location by either the owner or an agent of the owner and you came back anyway. All right, that's what's known as wanton trespass. Well, let's go back to our friend with the uh, potato crisps. Do we know this guy? Let's say no. So we've never told him not to be there. And have we ever, do we have a posted no trespassing sign? Most people don't have that in front of their home. So has he committed the crime of trespassing? No. Let's go to burglary. Let's look at burglary. That's what a burglar looks like. Same way, same hoodie, exact same hoodie, he goes home and hacks, exact same thing, all right? <clears throat> so, there are four different degrees of burglary, although fourth degree burglary has three subparts, so pretty much I just refer to this as the six degrees of burglary. <clears throat> You'll notice that most of them involve B&E, breaking and entering. Most of them involve breaking and entering. Well, what does that mean? What do you have to do to break into a building? It sounds pretty, uh, pretty, you know, like you got to do a lot of stuff. Baseball bat to a window, you got to kick in the door or something like that. Well, the Maryland courts have drawn it way, 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 way more narrowly than that. And other uh, common law courts have, have gone a similar route. All you have to do is displace something. So just, just the slightest pushing open of a door that's, or that's closed. You, with your little, you, I forgot which one was the pinky. You use your pinky, just push that door open, and you've now committed a B&E. If you have to move anything to gain access, if you have to move anything to gain access, that is considered breaking and entering. Now, even if you don't have to move anything to get in, you can still be convicted of burglary. It's also illegal to be on someone's property with the intent to commit theft. All right? So, even if you didn't move anything, if you were there to commit a theft, that is also going to be burglary. That's why I specified that our buddy on the couch was eating his own potato chips, because if he came in and ate your potato chips, now he's a burglar. All right? But because he brought his own, he's a very conscientious trespasser. All right? He uh, brought his own, and therefore he's uh, guilty of no crime. Now, you get there, and you're like, hey, get out. If he doesn't get out, at which that point, we have a wanton trespass. He's been warned not to be there. He stayed. Okay? 
which doesn't mean he has to like, you know, cross his fingers, wrinkle his nose, and disappear. He has a reasonable period of time to uh, gather up his potato crisps and leave, but he must leave. Otherwise, he is a trespasser. Um, along the lines of the uh, physical scope of a pen test, uh, being on someone's property with the intent to invade their privacy is also a crime in Maryland. All right, just some uh, other things to, uh, to be aware of. <clears throat> now, I get a lot of questions about lock picks. All right, uh, I have them, I'm sure a bunch of, uh, bunch of the rest of you, you know, you could probably do a vote. Maybe a third of you probably have them on you as well. Uh, are they legal? <laughs> All right, in the state of Maryland, they are legal. The only time they become illegal is when you're using them to commit a theft or a burglary. So as long as you're using them to open locks that you're allowed to open, that you're allowed to open, uh, they are completely legal. It's only when you use them to commit a crime that they become illegal. But by that point, you're already committing a crime, so you already have other issues. What counts as a burglar's tool? Pretty much anything that can be used to commit a burglary. And since a burglary, we got that B and E, pretty much anything that can be used to displace something, almost anything can become a burglar's tool. All right, you have lock picks all the way up to a thermal lance. Anything could be a burglar's tool if, it's, if it can be used uh, to commit a burglary. So <clears throat> what issue are we going to have within uh, our little framework here? Well, Company X is located in an office building owned by someone else. Anytime you're dealing with someone who's renting property, you have to figure out how you're going to get in there without either trespassing or committing a burglary, which means that somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to get permission from landlord L. Now, are the only two ways to get into a building breaking in? Is the only one way to get into a building? I didn't have a second one for that. I thought I did. Turned out, no. All right, is the only way to get into a building breaking in? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, we also have social engineering. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, Maryland's uh, already thought about this. That is the one loophole that we've successfully closed because there's something called constructive breaking. Constructive breaking. Constructive breaking and entering occurs where you trick someone into letting you in where they would not otherwise. So if you cleverly uh, convince someone that you actually belong there, that's why they let you in, you've still committed a, uh, a uh, B&E. All right, it's called constructive breaking. Constructive breaking. Now, does that mean you can never do it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What it means is you need to have permission. All right, if you trick someone, into letting you in somewhere that you are not supposed to go, like for real not supposed to go. You do not, it's not within the scope of work. You don't have authorization. You've committed a constructive B&A. Unauthorized use of IDs. <clears throat> All right. Making fake badges. Very popular. Easy way to gain entry in a, especially large buildings, something like that, where people don't really know each other. Uh, you can use a uh, co corporate ID to, uh, to go ahead and get in. Unfortunately, once again, under certain circumstances, it is illegal in the state of Maryland. Not always, just sometimes. All right, you may not make unauthorized use of an identification badge. So if the company allowed you, like it's, in with, it's within the scope of work to make fake IDs, you're completely fine. You're completely fine. But what if you use someone else's ID? What if, for example, in my situation, I said that Baltimore City employees frequently go to that location to conduct business, and the security guard waves them through. Would it be um, allowable under this law to copy a, to make a fake Baltimore City ID? And the answer there would be no. All right, it has to be within the scope of work. It has to be within the authorization that you've been given if you're going to use an unauthorized ID. Now, it's considerably more limited than that. It's limited to making fake uh, state IDs, city life, any kind of government IDs. You can't make gov uh, fake government IDs unless you have authorization. Uh, it's also factories, warehouses, plants, mines, quarries, railways, or utilities. All right, those are the other, <clears throat> those are the other, other ones that are, uh, that are limited. Uh, you also can't fake entry tokens. Entry tokens being things like tickets, uh, the little coins, things like that. That's also going to become an issue. Again, I'm just kind of doing broad strokes here. Obviously, there's 14 different exceptions to every sub-exception. It, it, it gets pretty, uh, pretty detailed, but just to give you an idea of laws that are out there. Uh, fake government-issued ID. All right, it's also, generally speaking, illegal with fraudulent intent to have a fake government-issued ID. All right, regardless of the purpose, I'm sorry, not regardless of the purpose that you're using it for. It is only with fraudulent intent. 
It's not only with fraudulent intent. You also can't do it to buy alcohol, get away with a crime, get health insurance, things like that. You also can't use it for a variety of reasons. In the realm of pen testing, all right, you may not use it with fraudulent intent. Well, if you've been hired to come in and test security, and so you present a fake government ID, that is not going to be that fraudulent intent. Just use your skills for good. Don't use your skills for evil. You should be good under this particular law. Uh, you also... <clears throat> You also can't have fraudulent uh, government documents. You can't pretend to be an IRS uh, collection agency hoping that people are going to send you money. That should be pretty uh, intuitive, should make sense, all right? But you also can't fake any government seal in general, all right? You cannot fake a government seal. So if you're going to go ahead and do uh, some social engineering, pretending to be a part of the government, make sure you do not fake any uh, government seal, all right? The emblem, the uh, uh, indicia of uh, authority for any government organization. Unless, again, that government organization has approved it. All right. It is also illegal to knowingly and willfully claim to represent another person without the knowledge and consent of that person with the intent to solicit, request, or take any other action to get personal information. Does that sound kind of like all of social engineering? Kind of. All right. So uh, this law makes it is pretty clear. If you don't have permission, don't pretend to be from that agency. But what does that really mean? Well, <clears throat> Maryland law is not very well defined. There have not been a whole, fortunately, there have not been a whole ton of pen testers arrested, and the courts haven't had to test these cases. Um, my recommendation would be, don't be the test case. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> stay within the scope of your authority. Don't, don't necessarily test the line on that one, because even if you end up vindicated, that means that at some point in time you were criminally charged, had to go through a trial, be criminally convicted, appeal that conviction, wait for the court of a special appeals to rule on it. It, it. It's a while. It's a burden. I highly recommend not being the test case. So going back to our setup, <clears throat> all right, the easy, an easy thing to do here would be make a fake Baltimore City ID, wear it, walk right in the building, let the security guard wave you through. If you don't have permission, don't do that. Okay, if you do not have permission from Baltimore City, do not do that, okay? It's going to be outside of, if it's outside of your scope, you don't have permission, you're going to run into issues with that being a crime. Um, also, all right, uh, the company X, Landlord L, if you don't have permission from Landlord L, don't fake hits, okay? Uh, don't fake things that you don't have permission to do. Don't pick locks that you don't have permission. You, you, you kind of see where this whole talk is going. Yes, sir? So if I have permission from company X, can I have permission from Landlord L? So if the security company has its own independent, generally speaking, you can only give permission that you have. If the security company is just an agent of the landlord, they only, they work for the landlord, but they have no, they, can, they have no independent discretion. They have to do what the landlord says. Then if you have the landlord's permission, you're good. Yes. So if you were to like misspell the word Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would recommend avoiding being the test case. <laughs> All right, so remember constructive breaking. Tricking your way in is the equivalent of breaking your way in, although one of them is much more likely to get the cops called if you're discovered. Uh, identification badges, only uh, fake IDs that you have permission to fake. Uh, false claims, be careful of who you're claiming to represent. And fraud, don't, don't do it. All right, going on to the digital side. <clears throat> the biggest, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> there are three major federal laws that come into play here, and each of them has a state analog, something very similar on the state level. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been broke, I mean, around for a very long time. Um, it's, you know, came around, uh, it was revised, 80s, 90s, it's, it's been around a long time. Um, and remember what I was saying before about different interpretations by different courts? There is hugely different interpret. I'm sorry, there are very wide, uh, a very wide range of interpretations when it comes to the CFAA. Uh, the CFAA is definitely one of the most hated laws. Uh, if you go to the EFF website, they have plenty to say about it. Um, but it also has an analog on the state level, and that's the Illegal Access Act. Um, in addition, you have illegal uh, wiretaps and access to stored communications. Wiretaps tend to be while something's in transit. Stored communication is when it's in storage. 
uh, and there's an analogs on the Maryland side as well. All right, the CFAA has a bunch of different parts to it, a bunch of different parts to it. Uh, the widest part of it is 18 U.S.C. 1030 A2C, which makes it illegal to access a protected computer without authorization or exceeding your authorization and thereby obtain protected information. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the CFAA as well. It makes it illegal to uh, extort anyone using a computer, traffic in passwords intentionally, recklessly, or, and this is the uh, danger for pen testers, negligently cause damage. All right, if you're doing a pen test uh, in an area that might be outside of the scope or, or maybe you did something that was unexpected and you caused things to crash, that's generally speaking going to be negligent uh, damage, especially, again, sorry, if it was outside the scope of what was allowed in your uh, scope of work. Um, accessing a computer to defraud and obtain value, hopefully that doesn't obtain, uh, sorry, pertain to anyone in here. Uh, trespassing in a government computer, if, if you weren't authorized by the government, don't do it. Uh, and the obtaining national security information, uh, don't, don't, don't do that one either. <clears throat> like I said, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1030A2C is the broadest provision. It is crazy broad, especially depending on where you live in the country. All you have to do is intentionally access a protected computer. All right? And you obtain information, uh, and that's it. So you log into something you're not supposed to log into, or you gain entry to something you're not supposed to gain entry to, you get some information you might not have even been looking for, you're guilty of a federal crime. Uh, what computers are protected on the federal side? Uh, you have the anything with a financial institution or the U.S. government. Also, anything used in interstate commerce or communication or foreign commerce or communication. This is where the category blows up because the courts have defined interstate commerce or communication as being anything using the Internet. Um, I think as the, uh, the previous speaker, a bunch of the speakers uh, today and tomorrow and for the foreseeable future, everything is uh, increasingly being connected to the Internet. So it, uh, intentionally accessing anything without authorization or exceeding your authorization and getting some kind of information uh, could be considered a federal crime. Yes, sir. How often does the contract contract protect you against that? If I go to a client and I say, give me your IP address and you want me to send you know, this Right. Yeah. It, 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 the question is going to come down to: Was it reasonable? Were you like willfully negligent? You know, or, I'm sorry, willfully blind? He was like, "Yeah, it's probably one, two, three, four. And you were like, "Yeah, okay, then." Uh, you know, that that kind of situation, wink, nod, kind of deal, uh, that might get you in trouble. But if it's reasonable for you to, you know, for you to think that they know their IP range, which generally speaking, that is going to be reasonable. Um, yeah, you, you're, that's going to be okay because you did not intentionally access a, uh, a protected computer. That being said, once you find out you're there, yeah, you can't keep poking around. You can't keep poking around. Uh, did someone else? Yes, sir. Does that apply if they have a terminal without a password or a Wi-Fi network that's not protected? Uh, so <clears throat> in order to gain access, you have to do something that is not open to the public, right? So if something is wide open, just similar to uh, a burglary, right? If something's wide open, you're inviting, you know, anyone can go in and out, that's not a problem. Um, if the password is password, it may seem like anyone can go in and out, and yeah, practically speaking, anyone could, but that's still going to be considered protected. So if there is nothing at all, all you have to do is go to this IP address and bam, there it is, then that's going to be a, uh, a, a different thing. What about if after you're in and you realize it's probably not something you should be in? Well, then I think you've kind of answered your question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. If you're doing a pen test for a public or a corporate prison, at what point is the data, I guess, or are you moving into federally owned data? Or I guess that would be the final scope. Yeah, let's say um, you know, you're doing an Amazon. You know, uh, something on an Amazon web server or something like that. Maybe they'd have some stuff for the Department of Education, they have some stuff for uh, local company, whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically if you're. When you access the Department of Education data, right, any, any part of the server that's used for or by the Department of Education is going to be protected. Or if you accidentally take down the entire server, that's also going to get you. Um, but yeah, but the other parts of it are not going to be protected, considered protected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If there's something saying don't go in, then yeah, you can't go in. 
even if all you have to do is click OK and you're in. Like, e even that simple uh, act is going to be enough to get you in trouble. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the difference with the Maryland law? Well, on the Maryland side, it gets rid it takes out that whole pesky protected computer thing. So under Maryland law, it's any computer, any computer within the jurisdiction of Maryland. So instead of that whole financial institution, uh, federal government, interstate commerce, blah, 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 it's going to be any computer, computer network, et cetera. Uh, and the way they've defined computer, as we'll see in a second, is very broad, very broad. All right, so the most important change between the uh, difference between the federal side and the state side is that it, you don't have to worry about the protected computer thing. It's any computer. It's also really interesting how Maryland has defined computer. Maryland's defined computer uh, as meaning an electronic, magnetic, optical, organic, or other data processing device or system that performs logical, arithmetic, memory, or storage functions. Um, I don't necessarily think they thought that one through. Because, uh, yeah, entirely possible screwing with somebody's head. Uh, state crime. Illegal accessing a uh, computer. Now, this issue has not been addressed in Maryland. The question is, what does it mean to access a computer? All right, on the Maryland side, <clears throat> right, it's illegal to intentionally, willfully, without authorization, access, attempt to access, or cause to be accessed a computer. Well, there's two different ways of looking at the word access. Does access mean actual entry, or does access mean any interaction? Right, is uh, war dialing, is that access or not? Um, if you're just dialing every phone number in a range, just, you know, regardless of whether they pick up or not, right? Is that interacting with the computer? Yes, right? If, let's say there's a modem on the other side, the modem picks up, that is interacting with that computer. But is it accessing that computer? And different states have gone different ways on this, all right? Different states have gone different ways on this, and Maryland has not weighed in yet. So even something as simple as like a, a ping scan of an IP range, right? would be interaction with different computers, okay? But it is not entry. It is not access to those computers. So until Maryland comes down one way or the other, again, I would uh, be, be particularly careful with regard to what it is that you're doing. Yes, sir? So how does the second clause for attempted access fall into that? Because I can say it's any attempted access because you were messaging out, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, but because pings are used for so many other things, it's not as clear cut that, that that's what you were trying to do. Um, now, you know, let's say that you're doing like a, uh, like a little like Smurf attack, you know, some kind of crazy thing where you're just sending pings from all over the place to one particular IP, then yeah, clearly you're attempting to do something to that service. But if it's just a, you know, a simple ping scan of a, uh, of an IP range, then, then, you know, again, it's going to depend on what the courts come down. That would be interaction. That's probably not attempted entry, uh, because that's just not a standard way for entry to be made. Unless you have like really carefully crafted, uh, packets. All right. <clears throat> wiretap is the next big federal law. Um, we think of wiretaps with regard to oral communication a lot, uh, you know, with, uh, conversations and things like that. Wiretap also applies to uh, electronic and wire communication. All right. The way the, the, the federal government's defined it, uh, oral communication, people talking to each other. All right. Uh, wire communication or people talking to each other over the wire. Electronic communication is not the other two, all right? So computers talking to each other is going to be electronic communication. Uh, the, federal, the Federal Wiretap Act makes it illegal to intercept an electronic communication. It means you have to use a device. Uh, it means you have to acquire the contents of a communication. The contents itself, we'll get that in a second, uh, it has to be electronic communication, and it has to be contemporaneous, all right? Your acquisition has to be contemporaneous with the transmittal. Now, <clears throat> contents of a communication means more than just the header information. All right, where is this routed to? Where is it coming from? It's not going to be the contents of the communication. The contents is going to be the actual substance itself. Um, oral communication sort of sets the way. Uh, the thing that you might, might not be uh, intuitive about oral communication is that it doesn't apply to things that are in the open. All right, uh, if we are all here, uh, let's say we're all uh, in a shopping mall, uh, little eatery kind of deal. Uh, where, you know, there's very clear cameras, things like that. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy. If there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, there is no wiretap. Uh, it's very similar that the courts have held, the ones who have decided on it, and Maryland, once again, not one of them. Uh, so the courts that have considered the issue have said that uh, Wi-Fi 
or any, any kind of uh, wireless signal is the same. If all you have to do is use the protocol to find out what information is being transferred, then that's not going to be considered a wiretap, right? Because uh, you didn't have to do anything other than what anyone could do. If you have to decrypt it, uh, even if it's web, even if it's something crazy easy to break, uh, if you have to do anything to break it, that is going to be considered a wiretap because there is, there is an ex a reasonable expectation of privacy even if you're using the worst form of encryption possible. I would, I'm not saying web is the worst form possible. It's not good, but it's not the worst form possible. But even if, you know, you did like a pig Latin, right? If you have to do anything to get to the communication, then that is going to be considered uh, an intercept. <clears throat> so we have the Federal Wiretap Act. Maryland has almost the identical thing. Almost. Um, does anyone know why Maryland wiretap law is famous? Yeah. Sir? Why, yes. Uh, <clears throat> you may have seen this fellow before. <clears throat> uh, well, there was a little incident where uh, he may or may not have engaged in uh, sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now <clears throat> that woman, in that case, had a uh, confidant who she decided to talk on the phone with. Uh, Miss Tripp, over here, was in Maryland. If you're going to have, if you're, if you're going to decide to wiretap a conversation, don't be in Maryland when you do it. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. The reason being is that a wiretap under federal law, if anyone gives permission to record, it's good. If any part, if any party to the conversation gives permission, then it's good under the Federal Wiretap Act. Not in Maryland. Maryland is what's known as an all-party consent state. Every part of that conversation, everyone who's involved has to give permission. <laughs> now, the permission doesn't have to be explicit. It can be implicit. For example, uh, you got, you know, this call will be monitored for quality assurance purposes. If you stay on the line, you are implicitly giving permission for the call to be recorded. All right. And so that's not, not an issue um, in terms of uh, Maryland wiretap law. If you just decide to start recording people, bad idea in Maryland. There's exceptions, there's limitations, things like that, but in general, don't do it. Uh, was there a, yes, uh, over here. Is the all-party consent state Maryland? Does it matter where the call originates from? So, <clears throat> Ms. Tripp was in Maryland. Ms. Lewinsky, I want to say, was in Virginia or D.C., um, but because one party was in Maryland, it could be prosecuted under Maryland law. <clears throat> yes, sir. So, to be specific about that answer, so if anybody on the call is in Maryland, then Maryland law would apply. Well, then the, the party, whoever does the wiretap, could be charged in Maryland. Okay. Right? Um, they're generally, you have to interact with a state somehow for it to get jurisdiction over you. So maybe, uh, maybe you live in Texas or, I don't know, southern Texas. All right. You could live in Mexico, something like that. You could record it. Maybe there will be a warrant waiting for you in Maryland if you ever happen to come here. Right. Uh, but for Maryland to charge you, you have to interact with it some way. Being part of a phone conversation involving someone in Maryland is going to be enough to give Maryland jurisdiction. What's that? Yeah, it's going to be considered uh, the same. <clears throat> All right. How are we sitting on time? All right. Now, let's say the thing about a wiretap is it has to be contemporaneous. It's an intercept, right? Think about an intercept in football. I assume, you know, some of you guys are familiar with the sports ball. All right? So the ball is in the air. You reach up. It's on its way to the receiver. You pull it down. Now, because internet communication, because networking communications protocols don't work that way, generally speaking, things are broken down and, and sent different rates, et cetera, et cetera. Contemporaneous is like ish. All right? It has to be acquired more or less simultaneously with the person that you're setting it to. So if you, uh, you know, doing something as simple as maybe you, somebody walked away from their computer, left their, <clears throat> left their email open, you set up a rule to automatically forward you all of their emails, right? When someone sends them an email, it is going to be considered contemporaneous that you are receiving their email at the same time they are. And so it could be considered an electronic uh, intercept. If, on the other hand, they get the email and then you somehow gain access to their email, all right, that's going to be considered stored access, which is a different thing. 
All right, so there's the federal uh, unlawful access to stored communications. There's also a very similar thing in Maryland. Uh, the thing about stored communications is uh, it's in storage. They're stored. <clears throat> so wiretap is in transit. Stored access is after it's already been received. So what are the uh, complications here? Again, if you have a full black box uh, assessment, meaning you're not, you know, maybe you're given an IP range and that's it, but you have no idea what's that next layer down, you might run into issues. Specifically where you might run into issues are going to be with BYID environments, things like that. Things where the resources, even, even if they give you the right IP uh, range, the resources in that network might not all belong to the employer. Uh, again, like I said up here, people bring their own devices, things like that. Let's say you run across a uh, commercial grade router. Hasn't been updated, the firmware hasn't been updated ever. Okay? Like you come across that as you're doing your, uh, as you're looking around, you're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> all right, you gain access to that, you can man in the middle everything, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one, uh, the company didn't have control over that router, meaning they couldn't give you control. Let's say that it was implicit, that because you used their network, you gave them permission, let's say. Well, what might happen with that router? Let's say you set up your, you know, you, you get reverse interpreter sessions on like, you know, five different uh, things off of that. What happens when they take those home? Uh, if you gain access on a uh, bring your own device and they bring it back to their home network, uh, you could very well create an issue. So when I, uh, the way to avoid that complication is to make sure that the company that is giving you this, uh, this assignment has something in place with employees that when they decide to have a BYOD device or they decide to bring something onto the network, they have given permission for whatever it is that you're about to do. Uh, otherwise, there could definitely, definitely be complications uh, when you get that uh, reverse perturbative session and you're looking around and you're like, I don't recognize this network. Where am I? Okay, uh, could, could possibly present an issue. Obviously, if you just close out the session and just pretend it never happened, maybe nobody notices. But that's not what the talk is. The talk isn't like, you know, what you can probably get away with. The talk is what is technically legal. Yeah, I'm sorry. For those of you leaving in the back now, like, no, this is not what the talk is. Just what's technically legal or illegal. <clears throat> All right. So tip here is uh, scope of work is everything. All right. The scope is definitely everything. When you uh, just to blindly accept a black box uh, pen test is a very, very dangerous thing uh, because there's all kinds of complications that could be involved. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be careful uh, because you're potentially exposing yourself to liability uh, just for trying to help someone else out. Uh, if you have a well-defined scope of work, if you have authorization from all the parties involved, you make sure you go up and down the chain, uh, you're, you're much more likely to be okay. Because in the end, generally speaking, to have committed a crime, there has to be some knowledge of wrongdoing. There has to be something in your head that, uh, that you were doing something uh, wrong. I'm not saying, like, you know, you've heard the thing, defense of the law is no, or I'm sorry, mistake of the law is no excuse, not knowing the law is no excuse. Sure, but it's not about not knowing the law, it's about not trying to do anything wrong. And as long as you stay on that side, you are more likely to be covered both equitably and legally. Now, sometimes that doesn't work out great. Sometimes the cops show up. That's when things get fun. <clears throat> the thing to remember is that it turns out police are people. Uh, who knew? All right, when you get pulled over, uh, the, the, yeah, sure, they may be um, some part of the anatomy head. They may seem that way to you at the time, all right, but underneath, generally speaking, unless you're in Virginia, uh, they are people. All right, they are people underneath that. All right, and as people, like the, a police officer is exposed over the course of their duty to ridiculous, ridiculous things. Okay, uh, the, 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 well, this is being recorded. I'm not going to tell you my stories, all right, but you get exposed to a lot. You, you deal with a lot and you don't know what it is that the officer has just come from. Uh, maybe they were just drinking coffee and eating donuts all day. Maybe they were. I don't know. All right, but probably there have been a couple of things that have happened. All right, um, thing to keep in mind is, it is not about who's right. If the police show up, let's say that you were, you were engaged to do this pen test. You were allowed to, right? They asked you to try to break in. Something went wrong. An alarm got tripped, or maybe you just got unlucky, and the police just happened to be driving by as you were uh, gaining entry, okay? Um, it's not about who's right. All right, probable cause is the standard for arrest, and probable cause is just a fair probability that crime has been committed by this individual. A fair probability. 
which means that all the officer has to be is reasonable. All the officer has to be, whatever decision the officer made, just has to be reasonable. Which means that do police make mistakes? Yeah. Yeah, police make mistakes, not all the time, but with some frequency. All right? And the issue only is that, that the mistake has to be reasonable. It has to be the mistake of a reasonable person. So my recommendation is, don't be that reasonable mistake. All right? If you see a police officer as you're trying to gain entry, and you're like, I could probably outrun him, that's a poor choice. <laughs> now, maybe you can, in which case, don't do that. All right? <clears throat> but on the other hand, maybe you can't, and if you can't, the chances of you talking your way out of that are almost non-existent. Okay? Um, so stay calm. Stay calm and realize that the number one priority for a police officer is safety. So the, that bag that you're protecting that has all your cool gadgets and everything in it, uh, that makes us real nervous. Especially if there's weird things poking out of it and like things that are long and slender, like, you know, it could be a rifle, something like that. Sure, it's just a Yagi antenna for you, you know, like, but the officer doesn't know that until everything's been calmed down. So allow the situation to de-escalate. Help the situation de-escalate. Bring everyone's tension nice and low because then you can have a reasonable conversation. If you get in the officer's face and you're like, I'm allowed to be here, this is my right, like, then the officer is going to get a little nervous and, and you might, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this in a way as in, like, you know, the officer is going to be vengeful. I'm saying the officer may not uh, be able to put all the dots together in the heat of the moment, is what I'm saying. All right? So don't run. Don't act evasive. You're there legally, right? You're allowed to be there. You've been given permission. You have your scope of authority, everything like that. You are good. Just relax. Now, that being said, maybe you're walking out of some dark bushes. Maybe you see the police officer. Maybe you just lean back on that back heel, hoping the officer drives by. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if they stop, stop hiding in the bush. <laughs> okay? Makes us real nervous. Makes us real nervous. All right, so don't act aggressively. Don't try to flee. Don't act ev you know, evasively. I'm not saying you have to just confess everything to the officer. Uh, you know, if the officer notices you, if they address you, have a conversation. Have a conversation like people. But, uh, but yeah, but definitely the, the more nervous the officer is, the less likely they are to make a, a nice, well-informed uh, decision. Uh, if you feel like if things are just going the wrong direction entirely, you've already tried to de-escalate, you're nice and calm, Good. Everyone's friends here. Here's my hands. Okay? Uh, if, if things are still going the wrong way, then calmly ask to speak to a supervisor. Okay? Calmly ask to speak for, to a supervisor. Not all officers are, like, super aware that uh, penetration exists, like, security assessments, things like that even exist. Like, that's an option. Okay? Uh, maybe they, they've never heard of it before. You don't have time to, like, sit down and, like, watch sneakers with them or anything like that. All right? <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so just, you know, it seems weird to us. It seems weird to us, so just calmly explain if they're not getting it, maybe talk to a supervisor, okay? Don't be a jerk when you say that, but if they're not connecting these dots, you don't want to go to jail. <laughs> so ask to talk to a supervisor. There is no get out of jail free card. Would I laugh if someone handed me one? Of course I would. That's hilarious, <laughs> all right? But it does not exist. It does not exist. And just having a uh, contact, like, oh, I got this uh, phone number of this dude. It's written on this piece of paper here. Uh, that, is, that is not helpful to us because um, very frequently when I find somebody uh, who has unlawfully gained entry to a structure, they present me with, oh, they're like, I'm working for Carl. Well, who's Carl? Uh, he lives here. Oh, where'd you meet Carl? That place. Right? Like, like, we get lied to constantly. Okay? And so having some guy's contact information on a phone, uh, maybe a phone number, is not necessarily enough to save you. We don't know who's on the other end of that phone, all right? We don't know who's on the other end of that phone. So the more professional information you have, the better, the more likely you are to be able to successfully convince us that maybe you are legitimately allowed to be here, okay? Um, so like a business card, a website with your information on it, you, you may want to prepare just a short slideshow on this is what penetration testing is, right? Um, again, just the more professional uh, information you have is going to be better. Just having a contact information, even if we call that person, may not be enough because I don't know who it is I'm talking to on the phone. Um, so just sort of to uh, review everything, have a good scope of authority, all right? Set established rules of engagement 
don't make up things on the fly. If things get made up on the fly, sometimes the wrong decision gets made. You may accidentally out act outside the scope of your authority. When I say don't do it, I'm talking to a room full of hackers. You guys are going to do it. All right. I'm just saying try to limit the amount that it happens. All right. Try to act, do it in a reasonable, well calculated way. Uh, have a standard authorization form. Okay. Have an authorization form that you work on with all of your clients. Uh, and maybe have as part of that form say like, okay, well, whose other, you know, whose services do you use? Do you lease this space? If you're, you know, especially if you're doing a physical test, something like that. Uh, who hosts your email server? Who, who does this? Do you have Amazon? Right? Like what, what, just have everything laid out because they may not think, depending on who you're working with, they may not think about all these outside vendors who may come into play uh, within the, uh, the penetration test. So, get permission, stay within the scope of your work, don't be the test case, and if the police show up, stay calm, stay professional. Um, this is me. If you guys have any uh, future questions, anything like that, um, I obviously can't give you legal advice. I work for uh, the city of Baltimore. I work for the police department. Don't be like, hey, are you going to arrest me if I do this? Like, like, don't. That's not something I can tell you. All right. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm big on open source. I'm working on getting a, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, this is my YouTube channel. Uh, it's Law and Otter. Um, right now, there's one series on there. But eventually, eventually there's going to be more. Uh, I'm also working on an uh, open source guide to uh, Maryland law for law enforcement that's going to be aimed at law enforcement, but it's also going to be uh, you know, useful, hopefully, to, uh, to everyone. I wouldn't check that website tomorrow. It's not going to be up tomorrow. But, uh, but yeah, so there's just things that I'm working on. Uh, if you do need an attorney, the uh, Maryland State Bar Association has a lawyer referral service. Uh, give them a call. Uh, you may need to do some explaining with regard to what it is exactly you're trying to get a lawyer for. Usually they refer people after the actual burglary hit, like I got caught in this guy's house and their pets are dead and you know, like it's a different, <laughs> it's a different thing, it's a different thing. Um, there are also a couple of uh, attorneys that I, uh, that I came up with as prosecutors. They now do civil uh, and criminal work. Uh, Jeremy Eldridge and Kurt Nachman, uh, they, they're, they're, they're reasonably uh, well versed in uh, both the corporate and the criminal side. Uh, I like them. I'm not necessarily saying they're, uh, you know, you got to use them, anything like that. I'm not going to give them any special favors. Uh, one of my favorite thing to do is actually be jerks to them. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing. So, uh, so yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, you're a resident. They call and you said, let's just do the same for the phone call. They say, by staying on the line, you consent to be reported. If my response is, I don't consent to be reported, by you continuing the conversation, you're not going to report me. Uh, probably the person that you're talking to on the phone does not have the ability to uh, regulate that. So basically your options there are to get off the phone or to stay on the line. I mean, if they have the ability to, then awesome. But my guess would be that the whatever call center they're working out of, they, they wouldn't necessarily be able to adjust that. Uh, but... Yeah, so if you want to say, like, you know, look, I'm not consenting to that, is it turned off? And they say, yeah, it's turned off, and then you continue, and it turns out it was recorded, then yeah, then that would be an issue. Yes, sir? Does that, uh, or that guy. You hear on the phone where you're consenting to be recorded, does that also apply that you have their consent to record Interesting question. Uh, I don't think that they anticipate being recorded. Uh, I, uh... <laughs> You know, uh, on the on the spot, I'm going to go ahead and defer on that one and say that uh, that is not a well-established legal question. Um, there's, I could see the arguments on both sides of that. I could see the arguments on both sides of that. Uh, guy, there. So, So if you had like if customer if you know you had called some co uh, some company and they had the blah 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 customer service this is going to be recorded when they transfer it within the company I would you know the the implicit consent because it, it's your consent that they're concerned about not necessarily all the other members of the employee. Generally speaking, you'd probably have to repeat it. Yeah, like the safest thing to do would be to repeat it. Um, otherwise, it gets all, into all kinds of questions of agency and permission, and who has uh, permission to speak for whom. And so the safest thing to do would be just repeat it. Yes, sir. Uh, 
So if I'm doing a pen test of a company, I think I have my I's dotted and T's crossed, but then I find that I land on an AWS instance or something. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to just stop then, and do I have any reporting responsibility or anything? So I'll, what I would say is don't go further, right? If, if you realize that you're there, you realize you don't have permission to be there, then yeah, because the fact that just because someone's data is hosted with a third party does not automatically give you permission to go in and try to access it other than the way that they can. So if you gain control of something that has a connection already set up so that you're accessing it the exact same way that it was already being accessed, then that might be one thing. Let's say you gain access to a, uh, a computer that already has a drive map to it from some, right, something like that. That's one thing. Uh, but if you try to gain access to it a different way, that, that's going to be more of an issue. Yes, sir. Are you aware of uh, pen testers being arrested or are they being sued or litigated against for the um, <clears throat> How do I put this? Researchers more than pen testers? <laughs> um, yeah, because generally speaking, like pen testing, someone's hired you to come at them. Researchers have, are doing it out of their own, uh, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, <laughs> right? Um, and so it's that lack of authorization that tends to result in bad feelings. So there was somebody who was hired um, by a police department in the Midwest, I don't remember which one, and they did a, it was just a simple ping sweep. And they found something that wasn't supposed to be there, and they brought it to people's attention, and then it became this thing of, well, why were you doing that in the first place? You weren't supposed to be doing that. And that became this huge contentious issue. Um, but yeah, so I mean, aside from that, maybe a couple other, like I, I'm not uh, aware of any, but again, I highly recommend not being the test case. Yes, sir. Um, again, it's going to be about, all about authorization, right? What did the bug, bug bounty authorize you to do? And did you stick with it? Is it just on them or did you spill over onto a third party? Uh, so it's just going to be about the wording of that exact bug bounty and what it is that they've invited. My, uh, yeah, all right, so just uh, one, one, one more. Yeah. Why it doesn't matter. 